Hi everyone, welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. One of the best places in the world to watch brown bears, specifically brown bears fishing for salmon and, and a wonderful opportunity to get to know the lives of individual bears and consider the challenges that they face in preparation for winter hibernation, which is coming up for them pretty soon. And this is uh, the time certainly to take advantage of the opportunities that they have to get fat, build those body fat reserves before hibernation. I'd like to welcome you along today to this play-by-play. -play. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org and I'm joined today by uh, a name and a voice you may recognize from years past, especially last year, Katmai National Park Ranger, Chris Leesrath. Chris, how are you today? How's your summer been going? I'm doing well. I've had a great summer here at Katmai. I uh, went back to Interp, so I spend a lot of time uh, out with the bears and the visitors. Um, I'm talking about my favorite subjects, bears and salmon. Well, glad to have you um, back on the, the show today, substituting for our regular rangers. Uh, and it, yeah, Chris joined me for a lot of play-by-plays -play last summer. So mm -hmm. I think she'll be back in the swing of things in just a minute. And like last year, um, or excuse me, last week even, um, we have many different webcams at our disposal. So it looks kind of quiet at Brooks Falls right now, but this is the Falls low cam view. We were just looking at the Falls main camera a moment ago. So we'll be toggling back and forth between uh, the different cameras at the falls. We have a camera downstream from the falls at about 100 yards, downstream of the falls at the riffles, and then at the river mouth, a couple of cameras uh, to look at as well. And probably the majority of the bear activity is going to be in this area uh, today and moving forward into October. So this is the river watch camera. We'll also be looking at Cat's River View uh, from time to time. And there's a mother and it looks like perhaps a yearling out there on the edge of the lake beautiful view there we have our underwater camera still active um, attached to the bridge across brooks river and we also have um, a beautiful view uh, up on dumpling mountain today some fall colors up there on the tundra already and i know we always have a few new people joining us on the broadcast today i'd like to welcome you who are watching from no matter where you happen to be around the world and welcome back to all of our longtime viewers but if you are new uh, to the bear cams. Let's take a quick tour, show you where these cameras are located. They're located, of course, in Katmai National Park, Alaska, about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. Brooks River is bisected by Brooks Falls, and it's only about a mile and a half long. So, you know, maybe a little less than three kilometers. So it's a pretty short river overall. In this view, it flows from left to right. And along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service, Explore.org, has several webcams along Brooks River. The signal from the webcams is either hopped off of a couple of radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain and sent to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away, where part of the park headquarters is located, or the signal from some of those webcams is sent directly to uh, a satellite uplink and to the internet from there. Another look at uh, the lower half of the Brooks River from the falls downstream. This is the location of each one of the cameras. We'll uh, highlight where those cameras are uh, here right now, Brooks Falls camera on the left-hand side of the screen in that yellow star. Its line of sight looks basically right across the river at the falls, but it occasionally it'll look downstream, and that's what we were seeing at the beginning of our broadcast when we first went live. Our Riffles camera, again, located about 100 yards downstream of the falls. It'll look across the river and upstream to the falls itself. Then we have the river watch camera located near the river mouth. That looks upstream from the bridge itself across much of the uh, lower part of Brooks River. We have the underwater camera attached to the bridge um, and looking downstream in the water. So sometimes bears swim by, sometimes ducks will swim by, and of course, lots of salmon there. And then we have the Cats River view, which is looking out towards the river mouth right now. So plenty of perspective to take in the river today. We're going to try to answer some bear cam viewer questions that were submitted in advance. Chris and I won't have the opportunity to look into the comments for your questions during the broadcast. But we um, there is this Ask Your Bear Camp question form. If you're looking for the link to that, ask a moderator or look in the featured comment if you're watching directly on Exploded Word. And we'll try to answer some of those questions that were submitted in advance during the broadcast. Fat Bear Week is coming up as well, and we're inviting teachers to take Fat Bear Week into the classroom. You can find a, a link to how to do that uh, in the featured comment on Explore.org on the Bear Camp pages or ask a moderator for um, that link as, as well. 
Uh, but Chris, you're at the river, of course. Um, you have this uh, uh, this on the ground perspective of the river itself. And you know, when I've been watching the cameras, I've been you know watching the bears uh, since uh, uh, exclusively on the cameras since I returned from Brooks River in uh, in like the middle of middle of July. And I've noticed a tremendous difference in their body sizes overall and how just how big they are but this is the you kind of like the final stretch of time for them the next several weeks for uh, for them to gain the body fat necessary uh, to survive winter hibernation uh how does the bear the the bear's behavior right now maybe differ from what you see you know when you're on the ground there in early summer i see uh a lot of bears like you said down river they're around the bridge uh which now they're eating the dead and dying salmon, which they may have turned down a few weeks ago. Uh, a lot of still high grading at the falls if they catch them up there, uh, but plenty of sub-adults and sows with cubs to catch the remains on their way down. Uh, still a good many fish at the river uh, under the bridge, uh, some nice ruby red and green fish for the for them to catch. But um, I think it's coming, to, it's drawing to a close and they're taking the scraps and looking for whatever they can um, to satisfy their hunger. Yeah, it's 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 getting down to crunch time uh, for, for the bears, so they can't really afford to miss many meals at this time of the year. In early summer, when the salmon are still when they when the salmon first arrive, uh, it's also the tail end of the mating season. So some bears will prioritize mating opportunities versus fishing at the falls. But right now, uh, mating season is long past. The clock is ticking quickly towards winter, so bears are trying to take advantage of any last opportunity to gain body fat. Um, and I, I think this bear, Chris, is just a great example of how big bears can get in the fall. This is, I think he's definitely a thousand pound plus bear right now. This is number 151 Walker. He has those really wide set uh, ears. He kind of has a conical um, face to me and a uh, you know, conical muzzle. Uh, but yeah, really healthy looking bear at this time of the year. One of the larger bears uh, we typically see on the cameras. Without a doubt, 151 is tremendous. Um, 32 is is bigger than I've ever seen him before. And he's been spending a lot of time in the office um, just eating fish after fish. And he's definitely packing on some pounds. 747 is around 856. Some really large bears have started showing back up at the river, which is not uncommon at this time. But it is good to see them packing the pounds on. Let's head down to, to the riffles right now because um, the riffles has a uh, you know offers bear or I should say offers bears opportunities as well, uh, just maybe in a different manner. So instead of sitting waiting for fish to come to them, which bears do at, at the falls, the bears in the riffles are more or less uh, patrolling for salmon that maybe are in vulnerable positions in the river. Maybe they can kind of sneak up on them and then pounce on them. Uh, perhaps uh, they can work the the riverbank as well. Sometimes bears will walk right along those well-worn bear trails, right along the edge of the river, and jump into the water um, there. And great fall colors at this time of the year, Chris. Uh, this I September was always you know, well I shouldn't say always, but maybe my favorite time of the year at Brooks River because you had such fat bears around, so many fat bears, lots of uh, you know spawning sockeye salmon with their ruby red backs in the water and then you had the fall colors on the on the hillsides and mountains uh, so i think this is the the most colorful time of the year uh, to be in katmai without a doubt it is breathtaking out here right now the, the fall colors are coming in um, the snow on some of the mountains in the distance even on top of mount katolanet um, it's just it's cool and crisp and we have a, the bears are coming back as really dark brown uh, beautiful coats. It, it's definitely my favorite time of year. It's not, it's not uncommon for me to be coming in to the visitor center and past, I think the other morning, it was 14 bears in the river, um, just all different types of sows and cubs, sub-adults, and even, I believe, uh, was in the river that day. So uh, it is definitely my, my favorite time of the year. And uh, just to see them trying to eat as much as they can, it's it's truly remarkable out here right now. And when you see a, a bear like, you know, Walker, he's he's moved positions just a little bit. Uh, you know, again, 151 is also nicknamed Walker. He was on the, against the far wall on the right-hand side uh, 
of the the webcam's view from this perspective, he's moved a little bit closer towards the middle of the waterfall right now. When you see the bears moving around, sometimes it's easy to get the impression that they're, uh, you know, maybe being impatient or they're not getting enough of food to eat. But um, they are incredibly patient animals and they will try different things depending on what they feel is maybe uh, gonna give them the most reward, for instance. Uh, they'll also maybe just take a chance um, because they, they, especially at the waterfall, they know that fish are often located in certain places and often they'll just take kind of like take a blind lunge into pockets where they know uh, salmon happen to be located. But overall, they're going to be uh, using, uh, you know, their skills and their experience uh, the, what they've learned in the past to, um, to catch salmon, maybe fresher fish up at Brooks Falls available to these bears, uh, Chris, but down at the river mouth is really where the majority of the food is available to them. Um, and I'm looking at a bear right here in the foreground. And I think uh, this may be number 879. He has a short left ear and a regular sized right ear. Uh, and he's a bear that we only see at Brooks River in the fall. We've never seen him at Brooks River in early summer. Um, but this is a time of the year where you see a lot of like what we call fall bears showing up. They're exclusively you know, bears that use Brooks River in September and October. This is, he is one of my favorites. He always shows up in the fall. Like I said, it's my favorite time of year uh, with the long neck. And he just seems to not show up in the spring, but every fall he shows up in Lower River to get as many salmon as he can. He knows where to find them for sure. He's right by the bridge at this point. And he's a noisy eater as well. I don't know if you've noticed that when he's when he swims by the bridge, he's one of those bears that, they, I mean, they all chew with their mouth open, but he breathes so heavily when he's eating salmon that you can hear him. Uh, and that's another wonderful thing about this time of the year at Brooks River is there's fewer airplanes uh, around. So it's uh, the, the soundscape is, is quieter and you can often hear some of those noises that bears make that you wouldn't be able to hear as easily in early summer because you don't have like planes or things like that interfering uh, as much. Uh, Chris, have you noticed how, how noisy of an eater 879 is? I, I have, and he is, again, he's just so noisy and um, and, he, and he does blow bubbles as well, which I find amusing. <laughs> um, just a very right. noisy eater, but w without the without the planes, you do hear a lot more. You one of my favorite things is to listen to them under the bridge with the crunching of the salmon which poor salmon but you know um it, it is one of my favorite sounds when, when they caught themselves a nice fish and and uh chowing down on it and he for one is is definitely very loud he's a big guy too um it's hard to get a, a perspective on his on his body size when he's in the water like this uh but he has a really long neck and sort of like a long muzzle, but overall his body size is, is quite large. So if he were to go to the falls and sort of hang out there, he would be in the upper echelon of adult males uh, at the falls. So you're wondering kind of like where he might sit in the Brooks River hierarchy. I think he would be near the top just, just because he has a large body bear overall. Uh, but since he spends so much time, uh, you know, in the lower river, where there's a lot more space available to bears, we don't really see him interacting as much with um, you know the big males competing for like specific fishing spots because he doesn't need to do that in this area. Food is is just really dispersed; it's available in many places, so we don't tend to see as many aggressive interactions between bears in this location versus the falls. There are a great many fish still left at the bridge, and even towards the falls, you don't see them as much. Uh, 435 Holly caught a, a good size silver the other day at the falls um, and down river here you still they're still catching the live ones um, this one I believe uh, they called the water horse because of his long neck but it, he does a good job and I, I think you're right he would be in the upper echelon at the falls but he's content to scavenge and look for some fresh fish down down river for sure And as he snorkels down river looking basically for anything that can't swim away, this um, brings up uh, to mind a question that somebody asked uh, a couple of weeks ago about bears and what they're eating, uh, because they're, they're eating a lot of dead salmon uh, at this time of the year. When they're snorkeling down through the lower river, they're looking for things that can't swim away. 
they want to eat the live fish, but in this area, the fish can easily just swim away uh, from the pairs. So really they're picking up dead and dying salmon. Uh, and somebody was wondering, um, Chris, if, uh, if the bears eat dead or dying salmon, how do they not get food poisoning from spoiled food? And that, I think that's an interesting thing to ponder because they're eating some pretty rotten meat. I mean, even though it's in that chilly water, that doesn't mean that the, 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 the salmon that they're, they're picking at is necessarily fresh. That's a good question. But if you think about it, uh, bears in other locations uh, can eat pretty rotten meat as well. Say, so, you know, if they're in Yellowstone where they can find a carcass that's been in the water for months and still they're able to eat it, I would think that their systems just adjust or um, are able to digest it without any problems, just like they can digest the bones that of the fish that, that you and I couldn't eat for sure. Yeah, their, their digestive tract uh, seems to be just better adapted to handling um, not only, you know, what we've, what we would consider to be spoiled food, but also just like really, uh, large and rough items that we could not swallow. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're swallowing like the vertebra of the, the salmon sometimes, uh, if they're really hungry, they're going to be eating like, uh, the gill plates and the mandibles of the salmon. And I can't imagine trying to push one of those down my esophagus. It, it seems like it would be extraordinarily painful, even if it would fit. And I did, if I could get through it without choking. But the bears, they, they don't seem to mind those things. Um, so I think, yeah, they're just better adapted for uh, eating, um, you know, rotten meat. Over time, you know, maybe it has something to do with their stomach acids, but also like they just have, you know, uh, when they're swallowing large hunks of food, their gullets are also just kind of bigger <laughs> than ours. So they can handle the bones much more easily. And sometimes um, you'll find it in their scat, especially at this time of the year, Chris, um, you know, walking along the, the pathways and the roadways, you really do have to watch your step because there's fish bones everywhere on the trails. And the, re and the only way that they got there is through, <laughs> through the digestive tract of a bear for sure there are fish bones everywhere and i think it's just one of those things that they're just better adapted like you said um it doesn't seem to bother them they do still prefer the fresh and the live fish but when it comes to this time of year i don't what do you think do you think it's related to the hyperphagia that maybe they don't it doesn't bother them as much once that kicks in so they're just able to eat whatever they find instead um, I don't know if it accompanies a hypophagia or not, but it's definitely, they're drawn to the dead and dying fish in the lower river uh, this time of year. Yeah, I, I wonder if um, a bear at this time of the year is maybe more inclined to eat food that's past its prime because they are in that hyperphagia stage. And if you're unfamiliar with what that means is for bears, essentially at this time of the year, they're feeling uh, or the, the normal mechanisms that a body uses to tell itself that their stomach is full and you need to stop eating, those essentially shut off for bears at this time of the year. So um, hormonally, they, they don't feel like full like we do after a good meal. Their bodies are essentially just telling them you need to eat more. And this is a purposeful adaptation that helps them pack on the fat reserves for winter hibernation. But it's also a behavior we can see as well, because they're going to be spending the majority of their their waking hours searching for food. Uh, and I, yeah, I I also wonder if you know they can taste the difference. I think they probably can taste the difference between like a fresh salmon and one that's that's um past its prime. But you know, when when you're hungry enough, you don't care. You just want something in your stomach. And and right now, bears, <laughs> it's hard for a bear to get hungrier than they are right now. Not as picky. <laughs> when you're hungry, you're just not as picky. They're also doing a lot of resting at this time of the year. So um, head out to uh, the river mouth. So this is our cat's river view cam, formerly known as the, uh, the lower river camera. And uh, some bears resting in this area. This is a great place to watch bears at this time of the year, Chris. I love, you know, coming out to the bridge area when I work there as a ranger in, in September. Uh, in the morning, you know, right around sunrise or so, if I could get there, sometimes there were too many bears sleeping in the forest before the raised bridge, you had to walk through the trees uh, to get to the bridge itself. And it was kind of a, sometimes a, a harrowing um, little journey. Uh, but if I could get there without being too close to bears, yeah, it was 
awesome just to be here listening to the Gauls, um, watching the bears waking up. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of times you would see them resting on the beach or you'd see them resting, you know, on the, this area that we call the spit, which is uh, a great place for families to hang out and younger bears because they have such a great line of sight. They can see pretty much everywhere. So if they're worried about, you know, threats or something like that, or if they feel less comfortable, you know, near other bears, then this gives them um, that opportunity to, to stay secure and be right next to their food source. We've seen a lot out on the spit and on the beach in the morning. You know how it is in the mornings that it, now it's even dark when we go to open the visitor center. So we get to see them wake up. We get to see them make their way to the river to see if there's any fish. And then sometimes they just go over the spit and rest there for a little while longer. Uh, I think it's this time of year. It's again, it's now it's dark for them like it is for us. Um, and they just like to eat and sleep mostly. And I think that this is uh, Bear 402. Uh, she has a single yearling, if my identification of her is, is correct. Uh, she is a, an extremely experienced mother bear. So she's in her mid twenties and uh, this cub represents her eighth litter, believe it or not. Uh, so she successfully weaned many cubs in the past. She hasn't been able to keep all of her cubs. Uh, you know, they, they, they died for various reasons or disappeared for reasons that we don't know. Uh, so she's, she's lost entire litter. Sometimes she's lost just like, a, um, you know, one or two cubs out of a litter, for instance, but she has a ton of maternal experience. Um, and she's one of the, the older mother bears along the river, um, and, and giving, you know, her, her cub th this opportunity to learn how to use, uh, the river itself. And maybe next year, this, this, um, this bear that we call a cub right now will, will be on its own. 402 has done that with most of her other cubs. She's separated from them at the beginning of their third summer. I, I agree with your assessment. I think that is 402 and she is a very good mother. Um, she's raised several litters already, um, very experienced. So she knows where the safe places are. I think that's exactly what she's taking advantage of is out there with him. Uh, since that's the last one she has left, um, I think he stands a pretty good chance at this point. Yeah, yearling cubs, again, those are cubs in their second um, summer. They're not nearly as vulnerable to like bear attack as uh, first year spring cubs are. Um, and, you know, what's going to be maybe the biggest challenge for this cub is next spring um, after it separates from mom. If that is what happens, it's sort of an unconscious decision that mom's body happens to make. She'll go back into, into estrus. And um, a, a male bear might come prowling around seeking mating opportunities with mom. And that often forces the, the, the cubs to leave um, mother's side. Then af when, after that happens, it's, it's, it can often be a rough transition for the young independent bears. And so, you know, the lessons that they learn with mom right now are, are lessons that they're going to have to apply on their own next year if they, uh, you know, have, happen to be separated. Uh, but we... We know that 402 has uh, separated from cubs in the past successfully and weaned them, and some of them um, still use uh, Brooks River today. So, yeah, good to see her uh, as an experienced mother in her late 20s. Eight litters, I think that might be the record for bears at Brooks River. Um, you know, we have some other older females that use the river, Chris, um, but none have ever come close, I don't think, to having eight litters. So um, 402 is a particularly fecund um, mother bear. For sure. And um, there was the question that may be related to this that I see um, someone asked if the adults are fattening up for winter, what about their cubs? How do they survive hibernation and do the cubs still nurse? So that'd be an interesting yeah, question, question, especially with the frog tooth cub. Hmm? Yeah, let me bring that up on the screen here for everybody to read. Uh, so, yeah, the cubs or essentially they're, they're, they're preparing for hibernation just like mom. So they're getting fat. They're going to need to survive on their, their fat reserves, just like mother. It's only newborn cubs that, that nurse in the den. So mother bears will give birth in the den in midwinter, right around, you know, the end of January, early February, sometime in that, that time range. So those cubs will nurse in the den right after birth uh, and for the first several weeks of, of their life. But all of the cubs that you see active on the river right now, they're going into the den and they're going to need to survive on their fat reserves, um, just like mom. It, it can be kind of 
remarkable though, Chris, to think about, um, you know, a small bear like that surviving hibernation just on its fat reserves because they don't look as fat proportionally as mom. Uh, but I think it's maybe just, it's, it's a bit of an optical illusion, maybe a bit deceiving um, because they do have ample fat reserves to see them through, through that, that time of the year. But um, they often don't look like they're nearly fat enough to survive hibernation. But that's that's the strategy that they've uh, that brown bears have evolved. Well, when you're here and can see them up close and personal, trust me, there are some chubby cubbies here. Um, they they get fat off their mom's milk, and you know during the summer, and as they get to be yearlings and a little older, they'll start to feed themselves some on their own. But they're You'll see them in the Fat Bear Junior. They're pretty. They're pretty chubby. <laughs> and you know, some of these yearlings can actually be uh, more than two hundred pounds. Believe it or not, there there were some studies done in the past on the Alaska Peninsula, looking at you know the weights of bears and dispersal patterns and and things like that. And this study, I think it was from like the late nineteen seventies or something like that, found some yearling bears that were more than 200 pounds on the Alaska Peninsula. So they don't really only kind of look small in comparison to mom, but you could put them in most other ecosystems in North America and they'd be sizable bears in their own right. Um, you know, some reproducing female black bears only weigh like 150 pounds, believe it or not. So, so you know, yearling bears uh, in Katmai, they, they may not look, you know, nearly as fat as, as their parents, but they're, but they're sizable animals and they do, do carry a lot of body mass. Even the koi's can be close to 70 or 80 pounds by the time winter comes. So um, I think that's how they're able to make it through the winter is they've got plenty of fat reserves once they go in with mom. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, the, the cubs are, are big. Like if you had a dog that size, you know, charging at you or something like that, you'd think twice about how you're going to, you know, react to it escalate the situation. Uh, thankfully, cubs really don't charge people. They uh, they tend to push their boundaries sometimes when mom is nearby uh, because they're curious. They they can be bold. They know that they have this bodyguard behind them. Um, but yeah, they uh, cubs are, are bigger than they seem. Uh, when you when you're on the ground and you're face to face with a bear family, it's not just mom that's the that's intimidating. Of course, she is, and she's the most intimidating. But the cubs are also um, intimidating in their own way. Looking upstream now from uh, from the river mouth back to our river view uh, camera. This is uh, looking upstream and uh, perhaps uh, the river's most famous bear, Chris, number four eight zero Otis. Uh, he has he's had an interesting summer. Um, you know, we didn't see him until late July. And then he stuck around for about a month, and then he disappeared in late August for a couple of weeks. Now he he came back, <laughs> so uh, for for Otis that that is uh, an uncommon pattern. That's not something that I've known him to do otherwise. It seems like when he you know he was around in July, in the past he would disappear in August and then he would come back in in late summer. But you know uh, you know bears shift their patterns uh, for a variety of reasons, and I, I wish we could really ask Otis. You know what? Hey, what were you doing, especially in early summer? Because we just don't know, but he's he's filled in quite well. He was really skinny. I would consider him nearly emaciated when he showed up in um, in late July. But he's he's filled in quite well since then. He has, and he did show. I think it was the twenty sixth of July when he showed up. Um, that was a month later than he showed up last year, um, and everyone was a little worried. But we we're glad to see him when he showed up. You're right, really skinny. He managed to sit himself in the office, and did even I believe bear camp footage of him fishing all night. So he would sit there and just eat and eat fish. And he disappeared for a little bit. And when he came back, he's still looking pretty, pretty good size. Uh, and he, he'll be, I see him spend a lot more time downriver in the fall than he does in the summer. And so he's been down around the bridge a bunch uh, the last couple of days. And, a, and another bear approaching Otis's vicinity right now, maybe to, um, to scavenge um, some leftovers. Otis isn't necessarily an aggressive bear, but he will defend himself if he's pushed into that, that situation. It's hard to tell just exactly how close they are because the camera's sort of forced perspective maybe, may 
look the bear, make it look like the bears are closer than they are. Um, but bears, again, they're, all of them are opportunists. So if they can kind of sit downstream of a bear that's eating a salmon, um, and that <laughs> the bear that's eating the salmon is tolerant of the other bear, um, then yeah, they'll just kind of hang out there and, and see if they can uh, capitalize on on that opportunity. And you were saying, um, talking about the ones that are pouncing the, as the salmon are less and less active, especially my favorite places at the ripples to watch them just jump off the shore onto the dead and dying salmon along the, the shore right underneath the ripples. Um, and I said, normally they wouldn't even go after them, but now it's a good opportunity, less energy expended to, to get the diet, dead and dying ones. Um, and I think that's what it's about this time of year is how to conserve energy and consume as many calories as possible. Yeah, it's all about energy economics for them. Otis, he's a master of energy economics, very patient, very skilled. Um, he knows where to find salmon, you know, uh, throughout much of, of Brooks River. We'll see him at this time of the year, you know, again, scavenging salmon downstream. In years maybe where there's a lot of uh, salmon still moving in late summer, uh, up at the falls, he'll spend time up there as well. Uh, but yeah, extremely efficient. And it's all about gaining enough profit in calories to uh, to have a, just a giant savings account when they go into hibernation so they can survive that time of starvation because it's not cold weather that they're avoiding in the winter time. Um, bears are very tolerant of, of cold conditions. Polar bears, in fact, they evolved um, from, uh, from brown bears according to uh, genetic evidence. So bears can tolerate very cold conditions. They're in the water all the time and the water's probably in the 40s Fahrenheit right now. It's, it's, it's really the, the the lack of food that they're avoiding in the wintertime. And, and if bears have access to food, then maybe they'll stay out of the dens longer. Um, that has been known to happen uh, in, in areas where there are mild climates. And I, am, I also imagine too, Chris, um, you know, in, in California, when brown bears used to exist there, unfortunately they're extinct in California, but you can imagine, you know, on coastal California in the wintertime with like marine mammals washing up and all of the green vegetation on the hillsides, I can imagine a lot of bears foregoing hibernation um, because that's when they could find a lot of food. I agree. I, I think it's definitely uh, food related. Um, when there's nothing to eat, it might as well conserve your energy. And when they come out and there's nothing, there's no salmon when they first come out. And so they're um, dependent on the grasses and the sedges, um, berries, if there's any that early. And so, um, I agree. I think hibernation is definitely related to the uh, availability of food. I'm going to go back up to the falls here real quick because we had um, number 151 Walker. Move, he moved from the far side over to the near side. So a slightly closer look um, at him. Uh, and, you know, we're, the camera is looking kind of down on him, Chris. We can't really see how big his belly is, <laughs> I don't think. Um, from this perspective. But yeah, he is just a balloon at this time of the year. Really successful bear, had a great summer. Uh, a bear that ha has also shown a tendency to be a bit more assertive rather than deferring to other bears. He's he's willing to challenge other bears and stand his ground. But yeah, looking really good for him. So I think he'll have a good winner. I agree. He's. Uh, I think he's a little more confident with his size and he's not putting up with as much from the other bears and much more confident at the falls fishing. Now, I'm not going to give any spoilers about Fat Bear Week. I know a lot of people have been asking about that, but we're going to have a lot of fat competition in Fat Bear Week that's coming up. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with that, Fat Bear Week, it is uh, the our, our annual uh, tournament, a virtual tournament, where you get to, decide, get to decide who you think is the fattest and most successful bear of the year. So this is the bracket from last year. Bear 747 was crowned the champion. He was... Uh, determined to be the largest um, and fattest and most successful bear. But it's just not about size, of course. There's many other factors that determine success in, um, in brown bears. And right now, um, we are encouraging people to uh, vote on camp Fat Bear Week campaign posters. These were campaign posters that were submitted last week. We haven't announced the dates for Fat Bear Week yet because there's an impending federal government shutdown, which would affect the rangers who helped to run the Fat Bear Week uh, show. So um, 
we're still waiting for Congress to get their act together before maybe we announce dates. Um, but I hope that we'll be able to announce dates sometime this week. So if anybody has been wondering what are the February week's dates, that is why we're waiting for Congress um, right now. But I encourage everyone to go to the um, explore.org slash contest to go and vote for your um, for Fat Bear Week posters. And Chris, I thought we could take an opportunity to look at some of the posters that were submitted, especially the ones that were submitted by kids in classes, because I think those are really um, fun to, to look at. Um, the first one I'll bring up here is from uh, Camille, Reagan, and Skyler in Ms. Bauer's class. Um, there wasn't an, uh, a grade associated with that, but they are polling for 151 Walker, and I think that's a great choice. You know, we just saw him on the cam. <laughs> not too long ago. So he's um, a top contender, I think, in Fat Bear Week. For sure. And that's a, a wonderful picture of 151 for sure. Um, he's, his belly is just about scraping the ground. And I think they've depicted that very well. And then uh, Amy Blozer's class uh, is all in for Chunk. So they made this collage for Chunk. And I think, yeah, Chunk is definitely going to be a top candidate as well. Could be his year. I think uh, Chunk is actually maybe a bit bigger this year than the defending champion 747. So he is going to be a very tough bear to beat. And then um, this one was submitted uh, by somebody by the uh, the the pen name Bird Book, um, who is voting for Otis. Uh, so Otis uh, definitely a, a, a uh, always a. a a contender in Fat Bear Week, a favorite bear of many people. We saw how skinny he was at the beginning of the season, Chris. And I think, um, you know, when people see that he's bulked up so much towards the end of the year, it's hard to make a case against Otis. I think um, he's de deserving of a lot of votes this year. He definitely, he's, he's come made, made a major comeback. He was, as you said, almost emaciated. He's put the work in. He's spent a lot of time in the office and now he's spending a lot of time in the lower river, just, looking at as many calories as he can get. And I think that's a great picture of Otis. And, uh, oh, you know, that's not the only uh, poster in favor of Otis. So this one came also from another classroom. Um, so this was uh, Michaela's uh, submission, vote for Otis, of course, and a lot of people will certainly be doing so. Uh, but we also have, uh, you know, some fans of Grazer. So Grazer has um, gotten, I think, many... The, the attention of many people this year. Um, and I love sort of like the, the tagline on this, uh, this poster, Chris, it says uh, most dominant mother bear at Brooks Falls. And she is certainly the fiercest mom that I've ever seen. I also think she's the best angler on the river. I agree. And um, we had to put some votes in there for the girls too. You know, I mean, Grazer, uh, again, she's emancipated her too. She's on her own this year. She's looking to put on some fat and make it through the winter. Um, so I, I think this is an excellent poster for a great bear. Another um, submission for uh, Grazer. So this one comes from Taylor. So yeah, Grazer definitely has um, her supporters and fans out there. This uh, poster comes from Sarah from the, from the same classroom, I think. So vote for Grazer in Fat Bear Week 2023. Many people will be doing that. Uh, great picture here of Otis. I like the textures on this, the, the use of colors and those eyeballs sort of just like those focused eyeballs too. <laughs> that is something that Otis the, has. Um, ear, so I think that's a great The question. ear is spot on, <laughs> right? His ears are spot on. Definitely. And this, this one is, is from Claire. Uh, and then also uh, Luke uh, is going in a different direction. Uh, the Fat Bear Week champion, Luke advocating for the giant known as 747. Again, an excellent angler at the river. Uh, this year. And then finally, um, you know, the most dominant bear in the river often doesn't get a lot of support uh, for Fat Bear Week. You know, uh, a lot of people have, uh, you know, uh, mixed feelings about number 856. But one thing that we cannot, that we can, or we can always say about 856 is that he is a successful bear. Very fat, excellent fish, uh, you know, fisherman. And also, he uh, probably is the father of a lot of cubs along Brooks River. So um, Austin is advocating for 856. I'm a great admirer of 856. He's a uh, dominant. He's always puts the weight on. I, I can see voting for him as well. 
So thanks to everybody who submitted um, their their campaign posters. And again, if you want to vote for um, any of the bears in, uh, excuse me, in our, our campaign poster contest, go to explore.org slash contest and do that right now. You can vote once a day and the voting closes on uh, Friday, I think at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And here is um, Otis again, trying to get your vote in, in Fat Bear Week. So moving along the river very slowly, scavenging salmon, looking for anything that really um, can't swim away. Um, the things that, <coughs> excuse me, um, one of the things that Otis faces that younger bears um, don't really have to deal with, at least quite yet, uh, Chris, is, is worn teeth. Um, Otis really has, <laughs> He his his um his teeth are not in good shape. I guess to put it shortly, he's missing canines. Some of them are are look broken or worn down to almost nubs. Uh, his molars and incisors, especially. Um, so I think sometimes maybe these softer salmon that have been rotting for a period of time might be easier for him to sort of like pick up and chew. What do you think, um, Mike? Maybe he comes. He has more trouble. Uh, chewing the grasses and getting nutrients out of them with his teeth. And maybe when uh, he shows up for the salmon, that's when he's able to put on more weight. Yeah. I, I don't think he would, he would be able to eat a lot of like springtime vegetation very easily just because he lacks a lot of teeth and, and bears don't really chew vegetation like a, like a cow will or something like that, or a deer, like, um, you know, they're not ruminants. So they just, you know, they have a single stomach. Um, they don't have any sort of like specialized adaptations in their digestive tract to process vegetation other than having a slightly longer um, intestine than uh, like true carnivores, like uh, like a lynx, for instance, that primarily feeds on, on meat. Um, but yeah, I think the lack of teeth maybe is a big factor and why, you know, he might come back so skinny in the springtime because while other bears, you know, might be able to gain some nutrition on vegetation in the, in the spring and even gain body mass. There's evidence for that, especially for, for smaller bears to gain body mass on vegetation in the spring. I don't, I don't think Otis can do that. He's just too large bodied and it may be just hard for him to, to graze on vegetation with um, the, the state of his teeth right now. His fishing skills are pretty good still. I mean, he can sit in one spot and eat fish for hours. And it's, you know, on the cameras too, Chris, um, it's hard to see how many salmon are in the water and how many dead pieces of salmon are in the water. So maybe you can uh, tell us, you know, when you're walking across the bridge, which we just got a glimpse of and you're looking down into the water, what what does it look like when you look down into the water? The fish are still in schools. So there's more on some sides of the bridge than others. Uh, predominantly when you're first coming over from the lodge side, on the left-hand side and right-hand side of the, the platform, you see a good many fish. It looks like they're still staging to go upstream, um, especially about where that bear is. It's, you, you can see them coming around the corner over there. Uh, the dead and dying ones seem to be more in the middle where they're being washed down from upstream. Uh, there's some on the shores where, again, some of them are just taking the highest caloric parts of the fish and leaving the rest behind. Um, so you've got a good deal of fish around, but I think as they start to die and um, and spawn and die, then I, you're going to see more of them downriver and uh, fewer feisty fish, for lack of a better description, and uh, more of the making it easier for the bears to catch them. And a younger bear than Otis sitting on the riverbank right now, or oh weighing its options, maybe deciding to go into the water, maybe deciding, hey, I'm going to graze on some vegetation. We often see younger bears um, in, in this vicinity, hanging out, resting. Um, and then it's, it's a great area, of course, to go into the river and to feed on salmon when they want to. Um, Chris, this bear seems to have um, some blonder ears. It's not the blondest bear that we see on the river. I think uh, bears like Grazer, for instance, and Holly, who we haven't seen on the cameras yet um, during the broadcast today. Uh, but, you know, those those females are very blonde, but it, it's somewhat common to see bears with blonder ears in, in Kamai. For sure. And this one looks more like a honey color than the blonde of Grazer and Holly. 
Um, but the, the blonde ears are pretty distinctive. It's a good looking bear. And there's a question um, about blonde fur that actually came up and came in in advance. And this person wrote in, is blonde fall fur that we see on the 435 Holly and 128 Grazer a recessive trait? Is there a reason we don't see it uh, on, on other bears similar to those two? Um, you know, and I, I'm not sure if it's a recessive trait, but it might, that blonder fur color might be tied to like the second X chromosome, Chris. This is just like a wild guess for me because male bears are almost always darker in fur color than, than females. So maybe it's, um, or maybe it's tied that darker fur color is more closely tied to the Y chromosome in males. I, I don't really know for sure. Um, but it, overall, when you compare males versus females, if you were to put them on a spectrum of colors from like blonde, to, to dark brown, you'd have more males on the dark brown side and more females on the blonde side. And that's what we observe at the river too. Um, most of the males are darker. Um, any 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 lighter bears do tend to lean towards the females. So I I'd have to agree with your assessment. And then one uh, 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 while we're on the subject too, another question about. Um, fur color or bears fur was this one. How do bears coats vary in terms of parasites, symbiotes, and overall health, depending on where the bear spends a summer? And I think this uh, question was in the context. I edited it down just so it would fit on our screen a little bit better, but I think it, it referenced other bear populations. Um, in, in Katmai, as far as we know, um, bears don't experience uh, or, ha or have trouble with like ticks, fleas, and things like that. Um, if there were ticks in Katmai, they would be all over the bears. I think we would see them probably in early summer because the bears are just so close to like the bridge and things like that. When they're shedding fur, it'd be easier for them to see. And people would be picking them up too. Not once in Katmai, and all the time that I, I bushwhacked out there, did I ever find a uh, a, a tick on me. So I'm not sure that they're there, but they, they do um, experience and, and suffer from ticks in other areas of, of North America and also diseases like mange too. So sometimes people will be like, oh my gosh, what is this monster of an animal? Uh, I can't tell what it is. And people think it's some sort of like cryptid animal, you know, like a, uh, like the Jersey devil or something like that. And, I, and you look at like the descriptions and the drawings of them and there, it really looks like a bear with mange. A, a bad case of mange. Uh, but thankfully, the bears in Katmai don't really have to worry about that as far as we know. Not as far as I know. Uh, I haven't experienced any ticks out here. My understanding is that there are no ticks along with one of my favorite uh, facts is that there's no venomous snakes in Katmai either. So that makes hiking a lot easier uh, for for people. So I would imagine it makes it easier for bears as well. <laughs> And you know, I actually, I'm one of the few people that I, I, I like being around areas with venomous snakes. I don't know. I love rattlesnakes and copperheads. I think they're some of the most beautiful animals out there. Um, but anyway, <laughs> back to, they, they, back they to bears. I've got, they are from a distance. <laughs> from a distance, from they're a distance. beautiful. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And I, just to be clear to everybody, I do not make any effort to handle venomous snakes. There are enough, enough dudes in my uh, demographic who uh, fared poorly with that, that um, I don't need to learn that lesson either. Um, and I didn't realize this at first, Chris, but this is something actually, um, you know, the mother just sitting on the bank there, yearlings on the other side uh, doing their thing. So another family, I uh, I don't think we saw them earlier in the broadcast. You know, we were looking at 402. This is definitely not 402. Um, do you have a, um, a guess on uh, this bear's identification? I don't. Um, let me see, is, is one... Does one three two have yearlings or two year olds? And not um, she has two two year olds this year. Yeah, but I don't think they're big enough no. to be two year olds. So I, I don't have an idea yeah, of this one. Okay, yeah, there's a, a couple of it uh, could be. Um, I think people have seen two seven three around. Maybe uh, if I remember correctly, she might have yearlings. I know number ninety four has yearlings. Um, you know, sometimes she I don't has. recognize ninety four right away. Uh, and speaking of 94, while we have time left in our broadcast and while mom goes into the river here, let's cut this to a clip 
um, of something that happened, I think, yesterday uh, between Bear 94 and a different mother bear, um, which was an interesting encounter between um, these, these two mother bears. So I'll pull this up and see if I can scrub through it here um, when I need to. But um, basically what we have is 94 sitting uh, in the river fishing. Her two yearlings are nearby. Eventually the cubs uh, get a fish of their own. I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. Something's certainly catching their attention to the left, right? So you can see I'm focused in that direction. Uh, but overall, you know, tension focused over there, but relaxed. Like we're not seeing them jaw popping. Um, they're not running away. Uh, the cubs right aren't at mom's side. Uh, but that's about the change. So eventually in this clip, the, uh, the camera freezes. Just gets... Uh, has a hiccup for a while. So I'm going to try to get through that as best I can. Then we come back to this live footage. Cubs are certainly alarmed. There's an, another bear approaching. It runs away. Um, camera has a hiccup. So we miss a little bit of what happens there. Uh, but then we have number eight or six, who's a mother bear appearing on the left-hand side and approaching this family directly. And I think maybe wants a fish, but mom's not having it. So 94 stands her ground this um you know these these bears do get in a little bit of a fight here but this is fairly mild overall and then there's that weird thing that happens we were talking about it before the broadcast chris but if you watch closely it looks like a salmon just sort of like leaps out of the uh out of the bears themselves almost right there and i'm not sure what that is if it's a salmon that they were fighting for that somehow got tossed into the air or if it's a salmon that was jumping out of the water behind them it's hard to tell uh You'd, you'd want to think that it was one they were fighting over, but I'm thinking maybe it was just a salmon in the wrong place at the wrong time. And a lot of people were wondering too, like why would 806 be so um, sort of aggressive and take that risk when you have salmon, you know, scattered, you know, throughout the water. So what, what's your perspective on that? I think she's hungry. I, I think at this point it's definitely to get as many calories with, uh, least amount of energy expended and if she just looked and said well maybe i stand a chance of getting it from the cub it was worth a chance to get into something with 94 maybe she thought just she could get it before 94 got involved but i'm i'm thinking this time of year especially that it's she's looking for some easy way to get something to eat yeah i think that's um maybe the the most logical or parsimonious explanation um, well, as we go back to live footage here of Brooks Falls, yeah, that, um, you know, she took a risk. It's, it's an uncommon risk for a mother bear to take because, you know, they, they seem to understand that other mother bears are sort of in the same situation and they tend to be a bit more lenient towards one another than they will towards like an adult male that's right up in their face or something like that. Um, you know, it's one of those, I think one of those questions we'd have to ask eight or six, like, why, why are you doing this? <laughs> Uh, why or why did you do that? That doesn't seem to make sense from what we can see, especially when we know that you can fish in other areas. Maybe that fish looked especially good. Maybe it was kind of loose in the water right in front of the cubs. And, and um, or maybe 806 just didn't anticipate that number 94 would, um, would be so, uh, so defensive. Uh, so I think there's several possibilities there. Going back to our live right here, look at the size of Chunk. That's what we were talking about earlier. He has gotten to be such a force on the river. He's just huge and um, tends to stand his ground when anyone comes towards his fishing spot. Yeah, just a giant of a bear. I, 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 this year, I think he is the largest bear on the river that we've seen. Huge belly on him. Um, prominent muzzle scars, so easily recognizable. So if you're looking at just like kind of a, a dark bear from the, a distance, sometimes they can be difficult to identify. But when you get a great close up view of him like this, you can see that muzzle scar. Uh, narrowly set eyes. That's another thing that I use to identify him. Um, he kind of has that little lower pout, that pouty lower lip though. <laughs> and that's another, another thing that you can use, but he's had a great year overall. Looked like he was fat when he returned in, um, in early summer. And that was fat reserves, leftover fat from the year before. And he's just kind of added to that, to that bank of calories on his body. So yeah, definitely uh, a successful bear this year. 
I look forward to seeing if he makes it into the brackets, and if so, if he's, if, I think he's a pretty good contender against some of the bigger bears if he makes it in. Oh, for sure. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say this is Chunk's year because often my predictions are wrong, <laughs> but this could be Chunk's year <laughs> in, in Fat, Bear, Fat Bear Week. Uh, and again, if you're wondering when that is, um, the National Park Service is still working through uh, options to announce the, the dates of Fat Bear Week. We're really, you know, it's it depends on what Congress seems like they're going to do because they haven't passed a budget for anything beyond September 30th. Um, so that would mean if they don't pass a budget by then, then um, most of the park rangers in Katmai will be uh, temporarily laid off um, until they pass another budget. So uh, you probably didn't have this on your uh, checklist of things that Congress can ruin, but Fapper Week <laughs> is one of those things <laughs> that they're that they're that they're mucking with um, right now. But overall, we can still um, expect to to watch you know fat successful bears at the river throughout. Um, the rest of September and into early October. So no matter what happens with the government shutdown, the cameras, since they're uh, paid for and provided by explore.org, um, they'll be running. So you'll be able to watch the bears even if February week is delayed. February week will not be canceled, but we're, we're not sure exactly when it might be uh, so far this year. Well, since I'm lucky enough to be working on it again this year with you all, um, I'm hoping that they settle things in time for us to just continue on with our Fat Bear Week plans. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me, <laughs> me too. When I, uh, when I, when we started Fat Bear Week uh, in, like the first Fat Bear sort of event was a Fat Bear Tuesday thing. We did it in early October in 2014, and then I expanded it to a whole week the following year. So that was the first Fat Bear Week uh, in, in 2015. I hadn't really considered about the federal fiscal year and government shutdowns and things like that, um, but that seems to be the reality of things uh, these these days. Um, but overall, I think we can we can also take solace in the fact that you know Katmai is such a tremendously beautiful landscape. It's a healthy landscape. We got to see examples of success in brown bears during the broadcast today, Chris. Um, there's a, some of the fresh snow up on dump, or excuse me, um, on Mount Katolan out there that we can see. Um, and this February week is not just a way to sort of evaluate the the body fat on, on bears, but it really more than anything else, it's a way to uh, celebrate the success of, in, in the health of, of Katmai's ecosystem. Um, and you know, if you want to, you know, take a look at a camera that showcases just how vast um, and undeveloped Katmai's uh, land is. Um, it's, it's hard to beat the Dumpling Mountain Camp. It's breathtaking, like I said, especially this time of year. And uh, I think uh, Fat Bear Week is an excellent way to share what a pristine ecosystem we have and how important it is to preserve it. Absolutely. Chunk um, doing very well for himself patient angler we'll see we've been seeing him catching some uh fresher salmon up here uh this this month uh especially some coho salmon they arrive in the in the river like in late august for instance and they'll continue sort of to run through parts of, of september um and the coho salmon are larger on average than the sockeyes and since they're larger and fresher from the ocean they contain proportionally more calories than a sockeye will in Brooks River at this time of the year. So it's really rewarding for bears just to kind of sit there and, let, and wait for their meals to come to them. If, if Chunk is at the falls and he only catches, you know, two or three um, coho salmon per day, he could still make a profit in calories just with, you know, two or three fish because those fish are fresh and they are, um, they're, they're large. So good for Chunk, good on him and, and great uh, to see all of the bears doing well um, this year at Brooks River. And Chris, um, we're just about out of time, but I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. Great to have you back on uh, this Bear Camp play-by-play. -play. Well, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. I've missed uh, talking about bears with you. <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll try to do it again, um, you and I, before uh, Bear Camp season is uh, is over yet. Um, okay, I'm in. My name is Mike Fitz. With <laughs> my name is Mike Fitz with uh, Explore dot org my co-host for today's play-by-play -play broadcast on september 2023 has been Catmine national park ranger chris cleesrath we don't have a play-by-play -play scheduled for this thursday but we'll be back next tuesday 
with another play-by-play, -play, and um, we may have a special surprise for everybody during that broadcast. So uh, stay tuned for that. And until we talk to you again, enjoy the Bears, and as we like to say at explore.org, never stop learning.